everyone to uh, the Equitable Growth Lecture Series. Um, my name is Austin Clemens. I'm the Director of Economic Measurement Policy here at the Washington Center for Equitable Growth, uh, where here means downtown Baltimore in my living room. Uh, the Washington Center for Equitable Growth is a nonprofit research and grant making organization uh, dedicated to advancing evidence backed ideas that promote strong, stable, and broad based economic growth. Founded in 2013, our mission is to bridge the gap between leading thinkers at universities around the country and policymakers in Washington, D.C. and the 50 states. To this end, Equitable Growth has funded more than 300 researchers up and down the career ladder through our annual peer-reviewed competitive grant-making process. Our grantees investigate the consequences of economic inequality and the key channels through which inequality may affect growth and stability. Uh, my work here at EG looks at how we can better understand the US economy through measurement. And part of that work is trying to enhance our national data infrastructure and thinking about what we need to do to enhance our national uh, data infrastructure to meet the challenges of, of, 21st century, of a 21st century economy. Uh, we want the, a federal statistical system that delivers timely, granular, reliable statistics to policymakers to guide policy formation. This event is part of our Equitable, Gro Equitable Growth Presents lecture series, which seeks to foster a deeper understanding of research and analysis on economic inequality and growth. Our lectures bring together leading scholars to explore how new research is, sift is shifting important conversations in academia and economic policy. Um, it's my great pleasure today to introduce Erica Groshen. Uh, Dr. Groshen is Senior Economic Advisor at the ILR School at Cornell University. She also served as the Commissioner at the Bureau of Labor Statistics from 2013 to 2017 and has uh, quite a background in, in uh, government statistics. So she's incredibly knowledgeable about our national data infrastructure uh, and the collection and creation of government statistics. She's going to survey the state of high frequency measurement in the wake of the pandemic. And then we're going to have a panel with Ji Hoon Han and Dana Peterson, who I'll introduce uh, after Dr. Groshin's remarks. Uh, before I let her get started, just some quick, uh, quick bookkeeping. So audience members, please feel free to use the chat to share comments with your fellow viewers and submit questions via the Q&A box. Uh, hopefully we're going to have a few minutes at the end to do a little Q&A, so, so please do get those questions in as our, our panel and our presentation uh, proceeds. Um, we ask that when you put something in the Q&A box, please include your first and last name uh, and affiliation. This event is being recorded and webcast. It's going to be available for others to watch, so please feel free to tweet along using the hashtag EGPresents. Uh, and I will now turn it over to Erica. Thank you so much for being here, Erica. Excited to uh, hear from you. Well, thank you, Austin. Thank you for inviting me and thank you to the Washington Center for Equitable Growth for this opportunity. Uh, I think uh, that this is a, a really important topic. I mean, uh, we're, we're not through the act the pandemic yet, and yet we can already start talking about some of the changes and some of the learning that we've had as a result of this experience. And that's particularly true when we think about economic measurement. So um, Austin asked me to kick this off by sharing some of my thoughts about what uh, the pandemic has meant for our assessment of the need for real-time economic measurement. And, and that's what I'm going to do today. So let me start sharing my slides. Um, and um, what, what I want to talk about today, see, there, we go. there we go, is uh, I, I wanna cover some basic ideas. First of all, official statistics are data infrastructure. So I wanna talk about that. And then I wanna talk about COVID's impact on official statistics from two perspectives, that of data users and that of the statistical agencies, and then end up talking about lessons for the future on that. So uh, this is just, um, just a reminder 
that official statistics are an example of a very pure public good, like roads, bridges, national defense, clean air. What defines a public good, it's just an economic concept, is that uh, these are things that are non-rival, which means that uh, my consumption of them doesn't diminish your capacity to consume them. So unlike a hamburger, um, we can both know the unemployment rate and my knowing it does not diminish your ability to know it. And uh, they're not non-excludable. It's very difficult to exclude uh, some people from knowing it when others already know it. So, uh, so uh, statistics are, are public goods. And in particular, official statistics are essential for democracy, for a market economy, essentially for prosperity, because the, in democracies and in uh, market economies, we want decisions to be made at the lowest possible level, but that only gets us to a good outcome, to prosperity, if people make good decisions. And information, uh, uh, reliable, accurate information is the key to making good decisions. This kind of information also provides a, a grounding on which we can promote consensus during difficult times. So if we agree on the facts, we're one step closer to, uh, to getting to resolution. Uh, when you have goods like this, public goods, they will be undersupplied by the private sector because they, the private sector can't make enough profits on them to, uh, to provide them. Uh, so it's a necessary role for government in order to uh, enhance national well-being. Now, uh, so let's think now about COVID's impact on official statistics. Uh, I, I just want to remind you that the, this is the one uh, graph that actually has data in it. The rest of it's um, from a much higher level. But I want to show you how extraordinary uh, the COVID-19 recession was. This shows the path of payroll jobs during all previous uh, post-World War II recessions and compares it to COVID, where the lines are the difference in the, uh, in the number of jobs since the, the cyclical peak before the recession. We, what you can see is that the COVID recession had this huge, very steep decline, much deeper and faster than any previous recession, that we then entered a period of rapid recovery, and we've had... Uh, since then, the recovery has been, uh, been a bit inconsistent. So that's the context that we're talking about. Uh, now, the data during this time, we had some a lot of people who wanted to know what was going on. So which users were really relying on official statistics? Well, you have uh, the, all of government, Congress, executive branch, the Federal Reserve, state and local governments. Uh, hanging on every statistical release because they did not want to be entering into this blind. And during the Great Depression, there was uh, a real paucity of official statistics, and our, uh, so our leaders were really, uh, were really flying blind. In this recession, it, uh, things were a lot different, but still they wanted more. Right? Um, financial markets, businesses, households, not delivers of, delivers of social services, et cetera, were all uh, uh, had an unending, uh, insatiable appetite for more information about what was happening in a real time basis. And they needed this to design and administer policy, to fight the virus, and also to provide economic relief, to assess policy effectiveness, to understand the long term consequences, and to inform investments. Um, and all sorts of other decisions that they had to make during this very stressful time. Um, and as they confronted what they received, they wanted more. They wanted more granularity to understand the demographics of the impact, the geographic impact, occupations, industries affected, et cetera. They wanted it much faster and they wanted it more often. They wanted uh, the, the agency had to have the agility to ask new questions because after all, COVID was new. Who knew to ask questions about that, that it would be so important to know who could work from home and who couldn't, who had internet access, who didn't. They also wanted more consistency across the products from different programs so that they could link and combine this information to answer the questions. 
Um, and we shouldn't forget that this was a fraught time politically as well. And so there were always worries about whether or not there was independence from political influence on uh, numbers. So they wanted assurance that the numbers were not being influenced. Uh, they, uh, as always, and maybe even more, uh, privacy protection was key. Um, so the people uh, providing data wanted to make sure that privacy was being protected. And all of this was to better inform decisions and to target policy. So um, there was a sense that uh, the, the speed of response was slower than it could have been if the data had been more complete, more timely, more accurate. Uh, so in response to this, the data users uh, uh, engaged in enormous creativity uh, in their analysis of official statistics. They linked, they merged, they modeled, they mined and they mined neglected series. Uh, journalists and policymakers in particular were doing this, but on think tanks, everybody was, was engaged in, in this. Uh, there were many new private sector data products introduced uh, some uh, or had attention grown on the uh, J.P. Morgan Chase Institute, ADP, indeed, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. Many, many more uh, private sector companies mined their data and tried to help fill in some of the gaps. And the government administrative releases got more attention than they ever had before. So in particular, unemployment insurance initial claims, and I'll talk about this more later, um, and state UI data were sources of, uh, uh, that people went to to try and get more information on what was happening to jobs, where the losses were, who, who had lost their jobs. And these were, uh, many of these alternatives were uh, were better than nothing, but were unsatisfactory because they weren't created with the care and the transparency uh, that uh, people really want uh, to, uh, when they're going to make major decisions. And certainly without some of the uh, standards that you'd find from a statistical agency. So the statistical agencies experienced this time also in, um, uh, in, uh, in quite a, uh, uh, with, with a lot of energy. Um, for one thing, they met uh, the production challenges, which might have seemed really daunting in advance. They basically shifted to virtual data collection when a lot of data collection had still been in person. And um, they, uh, so they, they had to shift many, many things about their data collection. Uh, they also had to be transparent about the impact of the, uh, of the pandemic on data quality. So uh, to come up with good ways of expressing what uh, new limitations on the data were, what biases might have been introduced, how to understand what the data mean. Um, and they were really, I think, uh, 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 you know, pretty uh, amazingly successful in, in meeting these challenges. And probably every single statistical program out there had some sort of new analysis that they could contribute to the impact of the pandemic. So they could look at, um, at their results and, and see how the impact of the pandemic. So there were a lot of new analysis done in new ways because of this. Um, and uh, many of the agencies added new questions to existing products. So one example is the Bureau of Labor Statistics added four COVID questions to the current population survey about working from home and whether uh, people were being paid, et cetera, in order to track the pandemic. And that has never been done on such a quick turnaround basis and has been hugely beneficial. Also, there were some brand new products that were created. The census created uh, household and small business pulse surveys. The BLS uh, did a new business survey and other agencies introduced some new surveys. The Office of Management and Budget worked very fast to approve these and get them on, out the door very quickly. Now, this was a kind of flexibility that was enabled both by the ingenuity and expertise that the statistical agencies had. And incidentally, most of this was funded by the low, by lower than expected travel expenses in the agencies. 
so uh, they had funds available. Otherwise, they probably couldn't even have done this, this work. So uh, uh, this was uh, an unexpected but uh, beneficial uh, impact of the yeah, of the uh, of the pandemic was that it did uh, fortunately. Uh, create some opportunities for doing the work that the, the statistical agencies otherwise would never have been able to do. So what are the lessons of this for the future? Uh, first of all, uh, there is more government administrative data out there than the statistical agencies are able to tap right now. So in order to meet the needs you know, there will be another crisis. We don't know when it will be. We don't know what it will be. But in order to meet those needs and even non-crisis needs for better data, uh, the statistical agencies need to be able to tap more government administrative data. Uh, fortunately, there has been an ongoing effort in this direction. There was an evidence-based policy commission uh, report. There's uh, the Evidence Act that followed that changed some legislation to enable more use of uh, federal administrative data. And now there is the Advisory Committee on Data for Evidence Building, the ACDEB, ACDEB, which is coming up with some more proposals along these lines. And these aim to improve access to allow routine sharing of data with, uh, with a statistical agencies and across them uh, to create a national secure data service for merging and linking confidential data. And then also there are some, uh, uh, some pilot initiatives that, are, that they're focusing on. And so to give you an idea of the potential just taking this step I want to talk about one proposal that that I've put forth in this area, and I was not I didn't come up with it entirely on my own by any means, but I think it would be hugely beneficial. So, so let me just take you through one of the things that we could do. So every state collects unemployment insurance wage and claims records, in addition to information on, on, on employers. And the wage records cover everybody who's covered by unemployment insurance, not just claimants. So it is sent to over 99% of wage earners in the country. If you took these, uh, these very simple wage records and made them consistent across the states and enhanced them by adding four things, job title, hours, work location, and demographics. And you could do this by adapting uh, standards that are being developed by the Chamber of Commerce Foundation for such records. Then if the BLS could then fund the, uh, the data curation and supervise it so that this was done appropriately across all the states and also fund state analytics so that they could use those data themselves better. The BLS could then use those records to improve many of their existing products, to add granularity and timeliness to JOLS, to payroll jobs, and many of their other programs, some by modeling, some directly. They could also uh, create new products. Remember, I talked about the attention on, that, uh, on, uh, on the initial claims reports. Uh, people who tried to use the UI initial claims reports as economic indicators quickly found that these reports, which are created for administrative purposes, are not, uh, don't have the known statistical properties that you would want from a, uh, a true economic indicator. The BLS has the expertise to create true economic indicators, so they could do that. Um, and then the BLS could probably shrink or even eliminate uh, at least two of its major surveys. So um, I have a link here to the proposal in more detail, but just taking this step would add a lot more uh, granularity and timeliness to our official statistics on the labor market. The other big lesson is the need to, to partner with private sector statistics. Now, too often uh, uh, casual observers think that private sector statistics are a substitute for official statistics. 
That's not really the case. They are a much more complements than competitors. Official statistics have a set of, uh, of known um, advantages. Uh, they are transparent. They, have, they, have, uh, they produce numbers with known statistical properties. They have access to sensitive government data that the private sector doesn't. Uh, for their surveys, they have high response rates, they're objective, they have long histories. So there's a set of attributes that are uh, very strong for official statistics. Um, private sector data has other advantages. They have uh, interesting proprietary methods, they have very speedy production and quick innovation, and they can, be, they can often be tailored to special needs. So putting these together, you can get further than either alone. Um, and actually, the private data very often relies on the official statistics for waiting for validation um, and for understanding what part of the sample they really cover. So uh, there are opportunities to, uh, to make combined products. And this, is, uh, this, this requires a, meeting a lot of challenges. They are surmountable, but I just want to mention some of them. Uh, there, you have to be sure of the quality of the input data. You have to make sure that you know, understand the biases that it has. You have to ensure that, that the data are production grade, that there are not too many errors in it. Um, you have to ensure that you have access to it. That means that it's affordable and that you can manage the risks that the data stream could change because the private sector obviously um, uh, makes decisions for its own purposes. And then there's the legal framework, which involves a lot of uh, uh, complicated things, uh, preserving the privacy, preserving the security of access to the data before it's public, and assuring that we have the proper uh, and no improper quid pro quo for the data usage. So those are some of the challenges. They're surmountable, but they are uh, not negligible. Uh, a third lesson is the need to coordinate the U.S. statistical agencies better. One agency can't do uh, the two things that I just talked about, tapping into more administrative data and, uh, and working with the private sector. They can't do this alone. So we, we need to collect the statistical agencies and put them in a place outside of the cabinet under the U.S. chief statistician so that they can use common inputs, com concepts, aggregations that will help people who want to combine data from different agencies so that they can share services safely uh, amongst themselves and efficiently. Uh, you want to preserve their missions and you certainly want to reinforce their independence so that there's uh, less fear of uh, interference from uh, cabinet members. And you want to fund them adequately and dependably, which is not the case now. So let me conclude now. Um, official statistics are data infrastructure just as important, I would say, as roads and bridges. Um, COVID also clarifies the need for better official statistics. I want to uh, provide kudos to the statistical agencies for what they did, but users still want more granularity, timeliness, and, and uh, agility, and so do the statistical agencies themselves. We can have better statistics. We know how to do it. We could use our administrative data better. We could partner more with the private sector, and we could reorganize and coordinate our statistical agencies to do that. And the result of uh, I think is quite clear is that this is one more step we can take uh, in a path towards greater economic uh, prosperity. So let me stop there and thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to talk to you and I look forward to people's questions. Great, thank you so much for that, Erica. Um, we're gonna return to some of those points in a little bit and, and I should note that Erica is sticking around. So if you have, uh, questions for her, please do put them in, in the Q&A box and we'll get to those. And, and I'm going to invite my two panelists to uh, come on video at this point. Um, so let me introduce our, our two panelists. So first we have uh, Ji Hoon Han, who studies poverty, inequality, and social safety net programs. Uh, he's an assistant professor at Zhejiang University, 
uh, after postdoc stint at Notre Dame and the University of Chicago. Uh, I want to note that it is, uh, I think, 3 a.m. for him, so we greatly appreciate him being here. Uh, if he yawns a little, that's fine. Everyone else has to, <laughs> has to stifle it. <laughs> um, and, and second, I want to introduce Dana Peterson. Uh, Dana is Executive Vice President and Chief Economist at the Conference Board. She was formerly at City, uh, has also worked at the Federal Reserve Board. She's a frequent commenter on screen and off for international and U.S. news. So we're, we're really uh, glad to have her here today. So pleased to, to, uh, that she can join us and give us some insight into how business economists uh, think about these topics. So we do have kind of a, a spectrum of different uses here, academic, uh, government, and, and business, which I think will be um, very, uh, very interesting. Uh, so we're going to come back to Eric in a little bit. I want to start... Uh, with Ji Hoon. So you have uh, a great paper, and I want to note that it came out in August of 2020, and it was analyzing data from, uh, I think, June or July. So it was a very, very short lag. Um, so I, I want to just first ask you, you know, can you give us a little, little summary of what you did and, and what your results look like? This is a paper that looked at uh, poverty during the pandemic. Sure. So we use the monthly CPS data, which is the main source of the labor force statistics for U.S. population. And a subset of the CPS sample is asked to report family income in the last 12 months, and they choose among 16 income categories. So we take this family income variable in the monthly poverty data, I mean monthly CPS data, and to estimate monthly poverty. And we find that in January and February 2020, which is the pre-pandemic period, the poverty rate was about 10.7%. And then the poverty rate substantially dropped to 9.3% in May and June 2020. And we use a simulation method and we demonstrate that the poverty rate in May and June 2020 would have been three percentage points higher in the absence of the government assistance such as the economic impact payments and expanded UI benefit. Great. Yeah, I think, you know, um, it, incredibly responsive to some policy questions people had, right? How, how were people doing during the pandemic? Um, and, and then, you know, a huge range of questions about what receipt of stimulus was doing. So uh, super important work. I, it's been about a year since you put that out. Um, the official metrics have come out since then, although I think they're covering like a very different time period than your metrics. Um, do you have a sense of, of you know, what the accuracy, accuracy of your estimates were or, or the validity of your kind of method for, for thinking about the pandemic? Yes, yeah, so this is a relatively new um, kind of data source. People used to estimate poverty. So we try to do some validity check in many different ways. So we compare the poverty estimate using the monthly CPS to the official poverty rates for the last, say, 15 years. And we find that the historical patterns are quite similar across these two series. And that said, we also find that if you just look at month-to-month -month variations in poverty, they are quite noisy, especially when you look at the subgroups of the population. And this noise is mainly due to the moderate sample size and so we only have about 8,000 households and 9,000 households in a month. So as a result, changes in poverty between consecutive months are not statistically significant in most cases. So we caution against reading too much into the month-to-month -month variation, especially for subgroups with a smaller sample size. Great. Um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, I want to note that, uh, you know, the new research, it's true, and, and they did great validity tests, but using uh, some data we've had forever, the family income variable on, on CPS. So, um, you know, try, trying to leverage that in new ways. Um, let me shift to you, Zaina. Uh, you know, we heard... Erica talk a little bit about some of the kind of how private and, and public data uh, can sort of exist in harmony, I guess. 
Um, you know, let's from a business economist's point of view, um, what are sort of the trade-offs between those two, or how do you view using them together, and, and how can they augment each other? Sure, Austin. Well, data are the bread and butter for your business economists. Like we can't do our jobs without data. And the great thing about it is that we have access to both public and private data. Um, and also being from the conference board, we also produce our, some of our own data um, that folks like to use. So I think that um, it's, it's important to use all the data at your disposal. Um, because if you just look at one data point, you can come up with some very um, interesting, but not necessarily accurate results. Um, so, and it's also very important in terms of interpreting data and understanding what the data are trying to tell us. Um, because certainly I spent 18 years on Wall Street and um, you have folks who are actually trading off of data and the data can be market moving. And so if folks don't necessarily understand um, what the data, how the data are defined, how they're collected, what they are attempting to convey, some very wrong decisions can be made and certainly lots of money can be lost. But it's also very important for policymakers, right? Because many, it's so easy to lie with statistics and with data. So I know we at the conference board are always attempting to make sure that people and policymakers especially understand our data so that um, they can make the right decisions and understand where the economy is headed. And so, I mean, this is just, you know, a risk that's coming up at the end of December where we could be faced with another government shutdown. And so there's going to be a blackout of data because all the data statistical agencies, the public ones um, that are run by the federal government will be closed. <laughs> and we know from prior uh, shutdowns that um, when that happened, you know, financial markets uh, reacted very negatively because they didn't have inputs. And also policymakers were, unab were unable to do their jobs, especially the Federal Reserve Board, which is in charge of uh, making sure the economy is running smoothly. If you don't have data, if you don't have information, it's very difficult to make decisions that are wise and accurate. Yeah, I... Um... I, I don't want to mention the words government shutdown too much, but um, I, we all hope we can avoid that. Um, yeah, I, I guess, you know, if, if you kind of can kind of reflect on, uh, you know, as you were going through the pandemic and looking at the data, you know, do you feel like we have significant blind spots where there, there wasn't enough data to guide uh, private interests in, in, you know, how they were conducting themselves during the pandemic? Sure. I mean, one thing that's super positive, if anything, about this tragic um, pandemic is the proliferation of new data, right? So, for example, you had Google Analytics, right, which was able to track activities, what people were doing, and finding that some of that tracking um, actually was indicative of what was going on in uh, the real economy, but also were reflected in, and confirmed and verified in official statistics. So that was just incredibly great. Um, I think the one challenge was there wasn't always enough granularity. And so that's why, you know, one of my favorite uh, measures uh, was, is, uh, and Erica mentioned this, um, the Census Bureau's pulse survey, where we had high frequency, real time, granular data, what people were doing amid the pandemic. And so what, and especially for policymakers in terms of the stimulus, what are people doing with the money, right? So it's being, you know, checks are being sent out, but what's the impact? And so it was so important to know um, how much people were spending on goods versus services, whether or not people were saving the money or paying down debt, and also who was doing this, right? Different age groups, different racial and ethnic groups. And so that was just so important to have. And, you know, again, the creation of, of new data, but there's always room for more. Um, certainly, uh, Erica also mentioned the unemployment insurance data. And so I received tons of questions throughout the pandemic in terms of what's going on, especially with regards to labor market shortages, where folks were, uh, many were saying, well, you know, you have lots of people who are receiving extended benefits and hence that's preventing them from returning to the labor market. And sure, that's so important for the administration to understand 
and also for the Federal Reserve to understand in terms of policy making. If we don't know where these missing workers are, or why they're missing, then it's very difficult to make decisions again. So it would have been so great um, to know, you know, who's actually uh, applying for unemployment insurance, um, how much they're receiving, and certainly that sort of information was only really available for a couple of states. I, I I live in New Jersey, and we did have very detailed data for New Jersey, but certainly on a more macro level, it would have been useful to have that. So I think. You know, some lessons that we've learned from the pandemic is, number one, um, we can create data quickly and it can be accurate, um, but we also need a lot of detail, a lot more granularity. And the one other area I would mention is just thinking about, um, you know, uh, the distribution across different ethnic groups where we don't have enough data. And certainly when it came to the distribution of PP loans, PPP loans, there were a lot of questions about whether or not small businesses, minority owned businesses, businesses owned by women were gaining access to these loans that were so pivotal for uh, getting, uh, providing a safety net for the economy after uh, mobility restrictions were put into place. And we just didn't really have that visibility. Um, and a lot of us were just kind of dependent upon um, what, uh, journalists were doing, <laughs> picking through the data, trying to do their best to find things. And it would have been so helpful if we had that level of detail, uh, and especially official levels of detail. Yeah, I think uh, questions that lots of us wanted the answers to, right? Um, I, so one more thing before we pivot back to the full panel. Um, I know the conference board produces some data of its own. I want to give you a chance to, to mention some of that and, and what you kind of saw during the, the pandemic and in some of your sure. high frequency data. Absolutely. Always happy to plug our data. <laughs> so the conference board, uh, we've been around for 105 years. So we have a really great legacy. And within those 105 years, we've created some really important data, especially around consumer confidence. And that's and you know, just the other day, uh, we launched, we published our October consumer confidence measure, and the current administration reached out to us for the the data series. Um, I mean, you know, most of them are kind of public, but it was just really so great that they um, took an interest, and that it's just so pivotal. And indeed, there was a paper written about our consumer confidence measure where they looked at expectations and they said, well. You know, if expectations fall by a certain percentage point over a certain number of months, it signals recession. And, um, you know, the CEO of our company called me, <laughs> said, are our data really saying that? You know, and so that's that's an example of really helping users of the data to understand what the data are telling us and what they're trying to say. Um, we also produce really great information on what CEOs are thinking as well as the multicultural consumer. And indeed, our focus on the multicultural consumer is new. Um, sure, there's data out there and even official public statistics on what different racial and economic groups are buying, right? But why? And so those motivations are super important to corporations, especially that are trying to cater to consumer desires. So we at the conference board highly value data. We create our own data. We use other people's data. We use public and private data and we love it. Um, and we just think it's so valuable and so important. And so we definitely support um, the efforts of, of the US government and other governments to create accurate, timely, trusted data because it's so easy for people to tell stories that may not be accurate with data. Yeah, um, and and I would just encourage people. Uh, I know a lot of Dana's work is is private, but she does have some public work on multicultural consumerism, and uh, and it's quite interesting, right? You would see like different behavior over online versus brick and mortar uh, consumption across ethnicities and, and race, for example. Um, all right, I want to come back to the full panel, and I, I think there's like a huge question that just kind of hangs over all of this, which is, you know, th there's a trade off. Uh, between timeliness and, and accuracy. Uh, the faster you want data usually means you're going to have to accept a little error. And the three of you are in, in very different milieus. And so, you know, um, 
I, I want to just kind of go down the line. Um, and, and the question is, how do each of you think about these trade-offs? So if it's publishing an academic paper, if it's giving advice to a, a private client, if it's, you know, we're, we're going to ask Erica, Erica is also an academic, but we're going to ask her to put on her, her government statistics hat. If it's putting out, you know, statistics that we can feel confident in, um, what is the right way to approach this trade-off between accuracy and timeliness? And, and let's start with you, Erica. Uh, so, uh, you write um, that there's often this, uh, this trade-off, but um, I mean, the, the solution is transparency and, uh, and also knowing what the data users need, right? And so, so I'll give you the example of the payroll survey. Um, the payroll survey uh, asks employers how many, all the employers that are included, um, how many people they had on the payrolls during the pay period that contains the, the, the 15th of the month, right? And so what? Uh, not all companies can respond in time. Some of them, because their pay period is a month long, and they don't know that yet, <laughs> right? And other times uh, because someone didn't get around to it or they make a mistake or whatever. But the BLS had determined that, uh, that there was enough information in the first round of responses to that question that they're able to pr produce the preliminary number every month. And then the next month and even the month after, they incorporate all the late reports into their estimates. And people have often asked, certainly when I was commissioner, but before my time and after my time, well, why don't you just get it right the first time? <laughs> and of course, the only way to, to have that number not change, well, there are two ways to have that number not change. One is to wait for a year until you're absolutely sure what it is. And then you put it out. Right? Uh, and then the other way is to not seek to improve that number over time. And you just put out what you've gathered that first month and you let it sit, right? So, um, you know, what the, uh, the BLS, I think, made a wise decision way back when, which is to say, we're gonna put out the preliminary number and then we're gonna publish the revisions and we're gonna to explain to people why there are revisions. And we're going to take some steps to make the imputed numbers that we use to substitute uh, for numbers that we don't have yet, uh, even better than they were before. So, uh, so there is a trade-off. Uh, the solution is is to know the needs of of the users and to be very transparent about the quality of the data each step of the way. Um, that said, so how have the needs of data users changed over time? I think that. Uh, they have changed to value quick answers more than in the past because financial markets move faster than in the past. Policy is now made faster than in the past. And, um, and we actually have more preliminary information, quick preliminary information than we used to. And we have modeling techniques that we didn't have before. So with all of those things, I think there is an opening for faster data that of, of reasonable quality, but not perfect quality than we had before. So uh, it's transparency, but it's also using all the tools at your disposal so that you get the very timely data as good as you possibly can. <laughs> All right, let's uh, shift over to Ji Hoon. Um, you know, thinking about this in, a, in an academic milieu, um, you know, how, how do you, uh, what, what makes you confident that, that you have publication ready numbers, I guess, or what's, what's the right way to think about that? So I would like to talk about you know, the level of accuracy and timeliness of the monthly CPS data. So when I hear this trade off between accuracy and timeliness, well, I suppose the accuracy refers to completeness of the data. So I'd like to talk about the monthly CPS data in terms of those two things. So as you may know, the monthly CPS interview is conducted uh, during the week containing the 19th of the month. And after data collection, it takes only about three weeks for the census staffs to review and release the data. 
And in most circumstances, there's no revision of the data, which implies that the initial version of the data is complete already. So using this data, one can produce statistics for the current month by the middle of next month. So I think this level of timelessness and accuracy is feasible because the census has collected this data for more than 50 years. And so that they have the capacity and skills and expertise to prepare the data set quickly. So I think this, uh, the timelessness and accuracy of this monthly survey, monthly CPS data can be a benchmark for other monthly statistics. Yeah, that's a great point. And especially, I mean, you, you and your paper, you know, are, are benchmarking against uh, government data of other sorts. And, and so I think that's, those are great validity exercises. Um, are, all right, Dana, um, do you want to talk a little bit about um, how you think about this in the in the business economist world? Sure, I, I agree with my two colleagues, Erica and Ji Hoon, that transparency is important. And also we have the tools to um, execute the process of data collection, cleaning and release much more quick, quickly than we did you know, many decades ago. Um, I would also suggest that we can use technology um, in a different way. So for example, for years, we collected data using phone calls. <laughs> and then we realized after a while, this probably doesn't make sense because we're calling landlines. And when you think about who owns a landline, your samples starts getting a little bit skewed. And we were missing an entire group of people who have cell phones and also people who use the internet. And so we shifted over our data collection for um, our consumer confidence measure from phone calls to online. And we'd also did that for our global consumer confidence measure. And we were very transparent when we made this change and we let everyone know um, that we were doing this. Um, and I think that uh, you know, the quality of the survey is probably better. We probably have a better sample. And I think also um, on this note of technology, embracing big data, right? There's more big data than there are structured data sets. And with big data, the concern is, well, maybe there's, you know, it's kitchen sink, there's too much in there um, and it's not really that accurate. But I think with the marrying technology and the volume of data that we can find um, ways to discover insights and new information that um, can complement the work that's done by statistical agencies who methodically interview people and businesses either <laughs> over the phone or through the internet. So I think that we, we don't have to sacrifice one for the other in terms of timeliness and accuracy. We can do both. And as technologies improve and as we learn better how to use machine learning and AI um, to assist us with the process, it will only get better. Yeah, I think uh, really echoing uh, Erica's point about the, the infrastructure we have, and, and there's a lot of um, maybe not low hanging fruit, but a lot of opportunities to improve our, our infrastructure. Um, all right, let me uh, just ask one more question, and, and then we do have some, some questions from the audience. Um, but Equitable Growth has a request for proposals coming out in, in a couple weeks uh, for uh, economic research into broad and, and sustainable uh, growth. I, I just want to kind of, again, go down the line and if, if people have thoughts, um, you know, what are kind of the next frontiers in this area? Are, are there, is there current research that you've read in the realm of high frequency measurement that you're excited about? Um, papers you saw during the pandemic that, that you think are great, or, you know, on the flip side of that, uh, what are the sort of next things that we should be looking at? What's, what's the next, you know, um, research frontier for advancing high frequency uh, measurement uh, analysis? Uh, let's start with Erica. Well, uh, I suppose um, um, as a, because I'm a labor economist and, and, and it is the largest and most complicated market 
in the country. I'm, I'm focused on that. And I would say um, it really gets back to exploiting these claims and wage records that the unemployment insurance system has. How do we tap those so that we know on a um, much closer to real-time basis what's going on, where jobs are being created and lost, and why and when. Uh, that's, I, I think, a huge opportunity that, um, that we have that, uh, that could give us uh, dashboards uh, you know, very, close, um, very close to real time you know, on, a, on a weekly basis on what's going on. Right? And, and then how do, we, how do we take that huge amount of data and bring it, uh, uh, a process it to give us uh, the indicators that we really need. So kind of how do we design the right indicators from all that information, which um, is not quite as obvious as it might seem, right? Because, we, because the data will be affected by the administrative vagaries of the program. And so you need to be able to, to process that. But I, I, to me, that seems like uh, the kind of project that would be really, uh, really beneficial to to begin to, to 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 design the next generation of economic indicators from that information augmented by what other inputs you need. Great, uh, Ji Hoon, do you have uh, thoughts about this one? Yes, so I think there's really a lot of fascinating high frequency data set, and especially those collected by some big companies such as Amazon or Google. But unfortunately, and as Erica mentioned, many of them are not publicly available. So the challenge is that for most firms, creating this social value may not be their main goal. So we need to think how policymakers and researchers may want to think about how to encourage firms to share some of their data set. And in doing so, we also need to think about how to deal with this confidential information because we, there's some kind of confidential information in those data sets. So we also need to think about how to fully utilize the existing data set while also preserving the privacy. Yeah, I, great point. And, and we have a, a question that's very relevant to this that I'll get to in a sec. Uh, first, I'll give Dana a, an opportunity to respond as well. Sure, Ji Hoon, you took the words right out of my mouth because I was thinking that it would be so great if we could have partnerships with um, credit card companies and the, the larger banks that have credit cards because they have real-time data and also retailers have the SKU information, the SKU data for their products. And so in real time, you can know who's buying what, right? How much they're spending on it. So we can get insights, not only on retail sales um, and services sales, but also on inflation. And certainly um, not just in the US, but around the world, many people would love to know what's going on in inflation, especially in areas that that are subject to hyperinflation and rapidly cha rapid changes in prices, even from day to day or even week to week. So I think that you know those public-private partnerships are important, um, and certainly you know anonymizing the data such that you don't have concerns about privacy or from a business perspective that you're not you know giving away proprietary information that might give your competitor a competitive advantage over you. So I think that. Now, those are areas that are that are super important. And then I would also add um, the power to survey quickly. So I think about um, organizations like Morning Consult, right? They've, they've only been around for a, a short period of time, but they're extremely powerful because every day they're able to panel hundreds of thousands of people from across the world, gaining insights, right? Um, and being able to deliver those insights rapidly. Um, is it the case that always those insights are capable of being plugged into an econometric model? Maybe not, but it certainly is important, especially around when policymakers are trying to figure out, you know, what's the pulse of the nation or even around elections and um, what are people thinking and feeling um, and what are, what's the direction that policy uh, needs to take? So I think the power to survey quickly and massive amounts of people and create lots of data points that didn't you can sift through 
and see uh, find the, the the relevant information i think is super important you know i know as an economist we we we've come a long way because we would you know so soundly reject anything that sounds like data mining <laughs> but i think we've learned that you know there's a happy medium between you know just looking for you know uh, you know, just the black box and seeing what gets spit out and, um, you know, having a hypothesis around the data. But I think that, you know, certainly that's another area that we can gain so much value from uh, high frequency surveys. Um, all right. So I, I, we don't have a lot of time left, so I'm going to ask people to keep responses brief, but we do have some great questions here that I want to get to at least a little. So um, let me just start with Morris Kleiner uh, from University of Minnesota um, asks, are government researchers or academics testing the quality of private and new administrative versus survey data? If you use one database versus others, will you get different results uh, on behavior issues? Great question. I don't think I know the answer. Um, I'll just invite anyone to jump in if, if they have um, thoughts on that one. Uh, yes. So I think the, the answer is yes. Uh, the, the statistical agencies are often doing that as they consider whether or not to add a source to their, their sources. Um, they also use it for validation. So the statistical agencies are always looking to validate their numbers versus something that somebody else might have. The last thing I would say is that uh, the better academic papers usually justify uh, and um, uh, uh, well, their findings, and uh, by by comparing what they can to the official statistics, that was certainly the case for the billion prices folks, for example, et cetera. So I think that that that's part of the the general uh, approach in this world is to do as much validation as possible, and that benefits both the statistical agencies and the private folks. So. Um, so I think that, that that's very much a part of this world. And, and of course, is absolutely right that it's, it's hugely important. All right, let me jump to one that I, I think would be a great one for Dana to take. Um, this is Kitty Evans. Uh, what are the incentives for the private sector to partner with statistical agencies? Um, great question. <laughs> sure, I think um, part of it is, is certainly prominence. Um, but all, and also advertising and marketing. Um, so for example, like S&P has been great at, at kind of taking over and merging and melting with other entities um, to produce data. Um, so it's a great marketing tool, but I think also the validation point is also important for the private sector because they want to know, because when I think about the financial sector, they are sitting on tons and tons and tons of data that they don't know what to do with. And they're trying to figure out how to monetize it, how to use it. And oftentimes if they can partner with a government agency that has the resources to really look at the data and figure out what it means, what it's telling us, then that's hugely valuable. Um, so I think, um, you know, there, there are huge incentives, even though, you know, having your credit card data alone may not be valuable but if someone can come and tell you how it's useful and if it can potentially uh, forecast retail sales on a routine basis yeah. then there's a lot of power in that yeah um, i would just uh, add that yeah. um that this is the challenge for the statistical agencies in developing the partnerships is beginning to understand uh exactly what incentives would be work would work and be appropriate and, and also for us, you know, in, in, for the people in the policy world, at what point, you know, might we need a stick instead of just the carrot? <laughs> All right, let me ask one more question. Uh, very brief responses, because I need to lead us out, but uh, this is from Jeremy Thompson. How realistic is it to expect timely data at the Metro uh, commuter zone labor market level? Seems like merging multiple months and accepting some error or exclusion of smaller option markets is our best option for now. Um, very tricky question. Uh, anyone want to, to take a stab at that? Yes, I will, uh, I will just say that, that he, uh, his solution is one of them, but another one is modeling. 
to uh, usual, most data sets have either a huge amount of granularity and are infrequent and not timely, or they are very timely and they have smaller samples and you know, not much granularity. Um, it's modeling that can, uh, that can give you both, that can take the very frequent information and as long as the relationships are somewhat stable, model that out to the local granular impacts. Great. Anyone else want to weigh in on that before I take us out? All right. Um, well, I want to thank everyone. Uh, this is a wonky topic, so I'm uh, so glad we have uh, some great attendees and, and great panelists to, to hash this over a little bit. Um, I want to just mention again that Equitable Growth's uh, request for proposals for economic research will be out uh, in the next few weeks, as I understand it, not, not entirely my uh, department, but as I understand it. Um, and so I would encourage people watching, uh, you know, people on our panel to, to take a look at that and to forward it around and, and consider applying. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for, for being here today. We really uh, appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you, Austin and the center and Dana and Jehu. It's a pleasure. Thank you.